Hi everyone, if if you can all start sitting. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay, hello everyone. Can you guys hear us? Perfect. So, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time today. We can blame the logistics president for that. Um, but, but the intention here today is to talk about impact through investing. We have these two amazing people next to me. I'm not going to lie, I'm nervous. Uh, but I'm excited. It's going to be a great talk. And we decided, because of the short time, to not give those long introductions. I'm just going to mention some interesting facts that I think you guys are going to like about this amazing people. So Marcelo, to start with you. <laughs> we have, you, you have a career, amazing career throughout many companies, uh, vice chairman of Chain Group right now, EB Capital, your recent fund in, in Brazil, Bicycle. Uh, but I think the, the fact that stood out to me the most was your journey uh, in your early years with the Bolivian national team. Uh, you, Marcelo was the head of operations, correct? of the team, and it was the first time that the, the Bolivian national team went to the World Cup. He's a big fan of football, we are all. No, no, but it was the first time that Brazil ever lost a oh. qualifying round. <laughs> uh, I was going to keep th that hidden. Th thanks, to, thanks to Tafarel, if you remember him. <laughs> yeah, so my, my goal was not to let it slip through, but he made it. And, and, and Linda here, uh, who has done amazing work with Endeavor, CEO and founder of Endeavor, uh, I think Endeavor has now more than 27 years old, correct? And the impact is huge, incredible, mostly in Brazil. And, and the fact that I wanted to bring is that we all know, or at least for the Brazilians here, you, you all know Aurelio, our dictionary. And, and there's an interesting story, which I'm going to let Lina talk a little bit more about. But that the, the definition of entrepreneurship and entrepreneur was, it happened because of Endeavor's impact uh, in Brazil. And, and it was only possible because of Endeavor Impact. So Linda, if you want to talk, just share a little bit more about that story. I think it would be amazing. Sure, it's so great to, to be here. I remember many classes, including one called Thinking About Thinking that I took in this, in this room way back when. Um, I co-founded Endeavor in part because of a taxi ride I had in Argentina where my taxi driver had an engineering degree and I asked him why he wasn't starting a business and he kept using the word empresario. And I kept saying, no, it's otra palabra. And we couldn't think of a word for someone who wasn't far, part of one of the top 10 families who had all the money and the, and the resources. And I said, wow, no wonder no one's starting businesses in 1997. Um, there's not even a word, there's no role models. So anyway, Endeavor starts, we're in Brazil in 2000 and my team every week was writing uh, this already uh, editor saying, emprendedor, emprendedorismo, this is what we want, and, and using examples. And one day, I think he finally gave up and, and called up and said, okay, partly because Endeavor's work, we're adding emprendedor and emprendedorismo into the lexicon. Uh, two follow-up stories to this. One is, two months ago, I'm in Santiago with one of my Brazilian team members, Igor Piquet, and he says, you're not going to believe this. We're having an Endeavor Catalyst Fund meeting. And he said, I was just in, the, in a taxi. And the guy asked me where I was going. I said, I'm going to Endeavor Catalyst. And he said, oh, that's this organization that invests in entrepreneurs. We need more uh, venture capital and innovation. So number one lesson, always talk to your taxi drivers. Very important. Number two is the person on Endeavor's team who received this call, our in, a managing director of Endeavor Brazil at the time was Paulo Veras. And two years later, he ended up co-founding 99, which sold to Didi and became Brazil's first unicorn. So, it's amazing story. And, and just to that, so that I have the definition here uh, for the entrepreneur, which would be one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risks of a business or enterprise. I want you guys just to comment on that, if you think there's anything missing from that definition. Marcelo, we can start with you. So. Being an entrepreneur today, I say, is probably one of the hardest things ever, right? It is, you know, my first business was building Brightstar to be the world's largest distribution company in my industry. And I would say the three things that are important as an entrepreneur is one, the ability, and Giorgio Paolo touched today, the ability to dream big, right? And most entrepreneurs today, they claim they dream big. And I always tell people, you got to even dream bigger because you got to figure out that doesn't matter how big you dream, 
the closest you get, you know, is you don't have a bigger chance. Secondly, it's resilience. I mean, the life of an entrepreneur is the toughest life that any human being can have because it's a constant life of up and downs. And when we've all done well, we always talk about the good and hardly ever do we talk about the bad. And I always say that the person who suffers the most is the person who marries an entrepreneur because you take him through the highs that are great, but the lows are pretty low, right? So resilience is definitely an important piece of this whole thing. And third is execution, right? We always forget that you know, the best entrepreneurs are those that have the ability to dream big, but also have the ability to execute. Amazing. Do you want maybe to comment on that? No. I, I concur with everything. The, the only thing I'll add is that, you know, I was known as Chica Loca for about a decade for even suggesting there were entrepreneurs in Latin America. And then when I went to the, when we went and never went to the Middle East, I, 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 I still was Chica Loca. And, and I, I developed this, this phrase that, you know, crazy is a compliment. I took it as a badge of honor. And I tell entrepreneurs, if people are not calling you crazy when you're starting something new, then to Marcelo's point, you're probably not thinking big enough. Oh, that's amazing. And, and just because we are in the topic of entrepreneurships and, and when you meet entrepreneurs, what's the first thing that you look for? And, and what, make, what makes you guys look for the decision to continue on further investing or just investigating if that is a, a person that you want to spend your time with and actually make an investment? So I've learned a lot of lessons, right? And, and I guess we get stronger by the mistakes that we made. And I've learned that an entrepreneur is just one little piece of the equation, right? This is a complete equation. And now when we're investing into companies, we look, there needs to be an exceptional entrepreneur, but there needs to be a team. And the team needs to be as good as the entrepreneur. That's number one. Good entrepreneurs alone won't do it. You need to build a company that has, we like to call it a mode and a model, right? You gotta have a company that has a, a competitive advantage or a differentiation. At the same time, there needs to be a model that will make money. And we learned that in, you know, investing in great entrepreneurs who had a model, but the business never made money. That won't work. Thirdly, as important is wherever this entrepreneur is going to play, the time or the total available market needs to be big. Because again, it's not good enough to have a great entrepreneur with a good business model in a small market. Because, and fourth, is there needs to be a way to exit the business. Because if not, you have so many, again, you can have great entrepreneurs with a great business model, uh, with a big time, but without an exit. So those are the four things that we look. And it all starts with a great entrepreneur, but again, great entrepreneur with great business. Because I've seen great entrepreneurs who failed with, in bad businesses. That's amazing. And, and Linda, just before you answer that, I think you mentioned a little bit about crazy and craziness in entrepreneurs. And we have, you have written a book called Crazy is a Compliment. So if you can just talk specifically about that within what you look for in an entrepreneur, I think it would be nice. Well, I, like Marcelo, when we're looking, I still meet every single Endeavor entrepreneur who comes, founder who comes through the Endeavor international selection process. And we're now in 40 countries around the world. And we look at this triangle of entrepreneur, business, and then what we call the inflection point. And I, I think that one of the things on the founder to business fit, I always ask people, why, why did you start this business? And if they've kind of reverse engineered their way to an IPO, I don't find it that interesting. Usually the best entrepreneurs find a real life pain point that they cannot not solve. They have to solve this pain point. It's not just some PowerPoint that they've done to get to a billion dollars. And so I always like that founder to idea fit. But Endeavor, and I think both Marcel and I, we invest at the scale up phase, not at the startup phase. And so I think when you think about inflection points, you want to see entrepreneurs and teams that have gotten through tests, you know, right? That you have not only fit that had the product market fit and gotten traction, but you've been through the test. And what have you done? What decisions have you made? And then where, what's your plan going forward? And I think that we always, you always have to stay agile. You always have to adapt to changing markets. And then how the entrepreneur processes information and thinks about that next phase is always what I like to see in terms of, is this the right inflection point for Endeavor to, to, to get involved? Yeah. That's, um, I hope everybody took notes of what they're looking for so you can potentially get an investment in the future. And now, shifting a little bit towards investments, uh, we're just talking now and, and you both have seen a lot and, and done a lot. And 
There was a period now recently in 2021 we, when we had a lot of capital available in Brazil and in the world, and, and I think that changed. There was an aftermath to that, but you both decided to stay. Well, we are here talking about Brazil, so uh, I wanted to hear a little bit more about what is your focus in Brazil and LATAM and, and why you decide to stay there uh, and, and continue to do investing and impacting the, this region. Well, the one thing all of you know that's consistent about Brazil is there are going to be ups and downs. And so I think uh, those of us who've been, and we've been uh, there since 2000, and watching, it's this is the most exciting time I've seen, and here's why, and we'll get to the, the, the capital in a minute. Uh, I was with Georgia Paula uh just recently, and we were saying, you know, 15 years ago, there was almost no tech in Brazil. There was maybe an ERP or an... Now, we're not only seeing tech companies, but five years ago, very few people spoke English from Brazil, and you could create a $100 million company just in Sao Paulo. So why would you look at the world? And now what's so exciting is we see Brazilians who want to expand beyond their country. Maybe they want to go to Mexico. Maybe they want to go to Colombia. Maybe they want to go to the U.S. They know what's happening in China, in India, in Saudi Arabia. So the globalization, the global mindset of Brazilian founders is better than ever. And now I'm very excited in particular with one, there's a number of exits happening or and happened, which is exciting. But one of the ones that means a lot to me is Pismo sale to, to Visa because both the chief technology officer and the chief product officer sit Sisters, women. We need more women in tech, and I think that that next generation. Thank you. This is why we stay. I wholeheartedly agree with you. I, I'm going to take a, a different view, right, and, and why I why I decided to continue after my soft bank career to focus in Latin America and in Brazil. One of the things that I love about Latin America and Brazil is the fact that opportunities are greater than capital. I mean, everywhere you go, there's potential to invest. And let's forget tech for a second and take a broader view. And that's an important piece. Everywhere else we go, it is a lot more competitive because what I call, what I like about Latin America, a lot of the tourism capital has left. People who came in, who follow what we're doing, and they realize that they go somewhere else. So that allows us to do our job better. Secondly, Latin America has size. Brazil has, you know, Brazil is now the ninth largest economy in the world. And if you believe all the projections that we have in front of us, Brazil will move in the next 15 years to be the sixth and maybe the fifth largest economy in the world. That's quite important. Thirdly, Brazilians do make money, right? The average income per capita in Brazil is the same as China. It's about three to four times what India is. So when you look at, you know, we, you do want to build products and services when consumers are going to be able to buy it. That's very important. And I think, honestly, I think it's up this time for Brazilians to screw it up. We have never had more tailwinds coming our way, right? I mean, if we believe, and I'm a huge believer in energy transition and what's going to happen, Brazil has the cleanest grid in the world. You know, 92% of Brazil is green in the energy sector, which means... One of the main trends is going to be how can you decarbonize industry? Well, if you have the cleanest grid in the world, you're going to be able to make green steel and a bunch of other green products that are going to have a beneficial treatment all over the world. So that, to me, is an important piece. Brazil is a key leader in critical minerals, which means you're going to be able to export a tremendous amount of, of minerals to all over the world that are necessary to power the, the energy transition. Brazil is going to feed the world. You know, the world is going to grow from 7 to 9 billion, and there's going to be food scarcity. Well, guess what? Brazil plays a key role. And what I love the most about Brazil is that finally we have studies or cases that we can follow. And there's no better way to create new entrepreneurs when you've seen exits like Bismore or when you see seen New Bank today be the world's best digital-run bank and probably the world's most valuable digital bank. So as entrepreneurs, when you see... You know, because before it was so far away, right? We saw Alibaba, we saw all those, and now in Latin America, we have Globant, we have Mercado Libre, we have Nubank, we soon we're going to have a whole bunch of others in an economy that's already digital. And I will finish that, you know, what I'm passionate about Brazil, as, as you know, I'm the vice chairman of Sheen, right? Brazil is an incredible digital adopter economy. There's not a single digital product 
that gets launched in the world that make the lives of people better that Brazil doesn't adopt faster than any other country in the world. I remember when we were the largest investor in Uber, you know, the best kept secret was that Sao Paulo, Mexico City, and Rio de Janeiro were city two, three, and four in, a, in Uber. And I can go on, on Sheen, and we can go through most of the apps. So I'm incredibly bullish on Brazil, and I will say this time is for Brazilians to screw it up themselves because we have so many tailwinds that should help Brazil in the future. And we also have five World Cups, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, but uh, going, going a little bit into Shane, because I think the, the case is very interesting and, and learning a little bit more about what you did there. Right now is a, a top of mind brand for consumers. So if you could just talk a little bit about how was that turnaround and, and your role in it. So Shein to me is one of the world's most fascinating companies. And there's always those companies that change industry forever, right? I like to say Uber changed transportation forever. Airbnb changed hospitality. We can go on and find those companies. And I, that's what Shein did and is doing today to the fashion industry. I mean, we are, we are, the way I like to explain Shein to people, in the old world, you used to have somebody who had such a tough job to try to think what consumers would want, and they used to buy thousands of pieces of inventory and hold it in stock. And suddenly, you have a disruptive company who comes into play, who's a platform, because we don't own any factories. In many cases, we have thousands of designers designing the product from us, and in the future, there'll be hundreds of thousands of designers. And what we do is we make thousands of new products every day based on what consumers want, not, not based on what we think consumers want. And that allows us today to be in 170 countries, to be the leading on-demand fashion company in the world. And specifically in Brazil, the numbers are pretty amazing. There's close to 45 million Brazilians who get their fashion from Shein. And mainly what I'm most proud of is they're mainly CD and E customers who we made fashion available to the masses at a price that is significantly lower that allows everybody to be part of. So it's a fascinating brand that continues to grow. And as we span our products that started as women's fashion, now there's men's fashion, now there's health, there's beauty, there's home. And I'm amazed at the reception that we've had in Brazil and how connected we are with Brazilians in terms of the brand. Amazing. And yeah, that it's a crazy impact and a crazy presence there. Uh, you talk, we were just talking back there and, and we were discussing about AI. And I think you mentioned a little bit now about how you personalize uh, the items that you have in store and everything. What, how do you see the impact of AI specifically for Shane, but also for other companies? I know you are in the, the board at Harvard, correct? And, and, and looking at AI. If you could just talk a little bit about that. And then I'll let Linda. To me, the artificial intelligence revolution that we're going to live will be by far the biggest value creation opportunity in the history of mankind. There's nothing, I don't think there's any revolution that is in the hands today of six, seven billion people who are going to make our lives and enterprise more efficient. And you know, I'm privileged to be the chairman of the board of uh, the chairman of the AI Institute in Harvard in which we have researchers and we have, I think now close to 31 labs. And I will just give you, you know, a couple of things of the way I look at AI, right? The beauty of AI, if you look at the internet, all the internet did was disrupt two industries, basically retail through introduction of e-commerce and advertising through introduction of Google and Facebook. What AI will do, it will basically disrupt every single industry, every single model. And why? Because what AI does, it brings the cost, what the browser did to the internet, which was the cost of information to zero, here you're going to bring the cost of cognition, creativity, and problem solving down to zero. And if you realize we hire employees to do that, and we already have a few business cases that are, that are truly amazing. I mean, in the world of football, to give you an idea, for those of you who follow La Liga, you know, I'm the owner of Girona, which is a, a Spanish football team. And we only spend 60 million euros, while Real Madrid and Barcelona spend 800 million euros, more than 10 times what we spend. And today, you know, we're third, or last week we're second in La Liga, and we're fighting for a champion's position. And the way we select our players is by utilizing data, is by utilizing simulation of how we can find different players in the world and how they're going to perform in La Liga. 
And that has allowed us to compete with somebody that spends 10 or 15 times as much money as, as we do. I mean, 800 million to 60 million, and we're competing for first place against Real Madrid and Barcelona. And that applies to companies like Shein, that applies to, to consulting companies. So I think what we're going to see the next five to 10 years are going to be potentially the most exciting years that we've ever experienced in life. So everybody that's studying right here, you know, get ready. And why don't I'll tell you, I'll finish this one. Don't, don't everybody put a dot AI just to raise money, please. <laughs> we saw that with Bitcoin, with Web3. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, that, that's a very valid point. Go ahead. How do you see AI? Yeah. <laughs> don't put AI.com. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that there are so many uh, ways in which lives are disrupted. We have the first aqua culture tech company in the world that came out of Indonesia that we've seen. We're seeing ag tech and ed tech is still not developed. And, and I think AI and the data and analysis will embe be embedded within everything. But I do get nervous when everyone wants to move the needle and be the new, new thing just to attract money. I feel like back to solve a real pain point. And then this is a tool that's going to be at your disposal, but not every company needs to lead with I'm the next AI in blank. Well, that's but but there will be co but there will be companies who do not use AI who will be out of business in the next few years. Okay. <laughs> Fair. I see. I see. True. Uh, but Linda, then then thinking a little bit more uh, about Endeavor and and this hybrid organization, uh, and I think a little bit about the stereotype that you had to face in terms of being organization focused on impact, but there's a lot that you guys are doing and, and that you are bringing real return. So if, uh, also the Catalyst Fund, if you could just explain a little bit about that, it would be great. Yeah, Sharon and my, uh, my good friend and now board member, uh, Veronica Serra is in the room, who was present at the inception of, en of, of Endeavor over uh, at SHAD and in the business school. Um, so I'm an entrepreneur and I, had an idea about supporting entrepreneurs in places where people didn't believe that innovation and, and, and people who didn't come from the right family uh, connections could start things. And there was no venture capital in 1997 period in emerging markets. There wasn't. So there was no way we could start a fund back in 1997. So we said, all right, we're going to start we're going we're gonna to start as a nonprofit. We don't like that word nonprofit, but we're, we're a community. We're of, by, and for entrepreneurs. And we're going to have entrepreneurs get mentored. And then I said, we're going to figure it out. We're going to be self-sustaining based on the success of the entrepreneurs. And they all said, oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And we never really raised money from foundations because they didn't like that we were helping build a middle class. And um, so it was always individuals. And so um, Reed Hoffman, speaking of AI, is on my board. And in 2011, he said, all right, Linda, now. Now, there's venture coming into these markets. Endeavor has to co-invest in these entrepreneurs, and we can, we can raise a fund. So scroll to today. We created a special model where we said, all right, it's going to be shared capital. So, in, uh, so Endeavor has raised $500 million, uh, um, on four funds, and investors get their principal back and 50% of the returns. And 50% go to scale Endeavor, the nonprofit that had started. And you get to choose, half of that goes to New York, goes to our, our headquarters, and half, you get to choose which country in the world, and Endeavor, you want to be um, your, your returns to go towards. And what is exciting is that a third of our investors are Endeavor entrepreneurs. So of by four entrepreneurs, the chairman of Endeavor Brazil is Sergio Furio of Creditas. Uh, the vice chair is, uh, is Cesar uh, Carvalho of Jim Pass. So these entrepreneurs, this is true everywhere in the world. So I think this is great, but the story is that in a 2017, a few years into this experiment, my board did not think it was so great. And they particularly got nervous when I started calling us a hybrid organization. We have the fund, we have the nonprofit, they're self-sustaining, and they said, Linda, you just want to become a venture capitalist or worst, a hedge fund investor like your friend Bill Ackman who's speaking tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? No, endeavors of by four entrepreneurs, we're going to get there. And they said, stop calling this hybrid. We're nervous. You're going to lose the mission. You're going to lose the secret sauce that made Endeavor so, so important. I said, no, 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 no. Entrepreneurs never cared for profit, nonprofit. They love Endeavor of by four entrepreneurs. And I was told, you can't use the word hybrid. Come back and find a new word. 
I was not happy. So three months later, I went to my board and I said, all right, you want a new word? Facebook, this was back in 2017, Facebook has 72 gender options. So the world has moved beyond the binary. Why is it for-profit, non-profit? We're profit beyond the binary. In fact, Endeavor is the world's first trans-profit. <laughs> My board said, oh, hybrid sounds great. <laughs> Half that board is no longer on my board. Now people like Martina Scobari and Veronica and, and Marcella's partner, Shu, who get it, are on the board. But I think it's a generational thing. And the last thing I'll say is I think these new models are coming up. And, and, that, and don't let anyone put you into a language box, put you into rules. This is about innovation. And sometimes you have to bring, bring people along where there aren't even words. That's my, that's my I guess, my, the lesson that, that recurs today. That's amazing. And, and, and just before we, we ended up here, uh, I had a question about growth and, and growth at all costs. I think that was something that in, in venture capital or even for entrepreneurs, it was, uh, it was preached almost and, and that we had to focus on that. But I think right now we, we live in a time that growth may need a different meaning. Um, and because our planet uh, is... We have issues everywhere, we have crisis, so I just want to hear your perspective in terms of that. How, how do you see growth in the next five to ten years? Well, I'll start because I think Marcella will talk about some of the, the green and the, the planetary things you alluded to. But for, for us, growth, growth in, high impact has meant growth. We've always, we've always thought if you have big social ambitions, big plans, you have to grow. Like why would you want, why is there a trade off? But I think back to your, your framing about the easy money is I think those of you who are about to start a business, um, actually it's very helpful that you've seen this transition and these founders have to make these very deeply painful cuts to get from growth to profit, growth with profitability, right? But I think that what it means is entrepreneurs get to write their own story then. I think the ones who just took the venture capital at the highest valuation and then were told to spend the money, I think they've learned the hard way that now when money goes, now you're, you're left and you have to get to a profitable company. That is ultimately where you need to get to go to. So the fact that people are starting off now bootstrapping, they're starting off, they're now, they're getting to profitability means they choose their partners. So anyone who is now investing is going to really have to be that smart capital we talk about. And I think the founders are in the driver's seat. So all of you are very lucky, I think, that you're coming of age now versus that moment of, you know, five years ago when people thought, oh, you just, you know, you get your Series A at 200 million valuation in day zero. And, and so I think this is, this is going to be growth with entrepreneurs really driving towards customer satisfaction. Is their product market fit? How are my employees doing? And, 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 and looking at those factors. But no, you, you can expand so from I, there. I have a few topics about growth. First is I love growth. <laughs> and I have seen good growth and bad growth. And I've been involved in both. So in a good growth, I've seen how you can push an entrepreneur like Jack Ma. You know, when I was at SoftBank, I was lucky to share the board with Jack. And when you push growth to an entrepreneur like him and says, go ahead and offer services for free till you get a scale and then later we can charge, you build one of the world's best companies. Or when you can sit with Yiming, who was the founder of ByteDance, who's all of you guys know TikTok, and you're pushing him to grow, and he understands the power of growth and built what I think is one of the world's most innovative companies, that's great. When you push growth to Adam Newman at WeWork, and he, so I always tell the Adam Newman story that was half our fault and half Adam's fault. Half, because we gave him an assignment that says go open a thousand WeWorks in one year, as that was our fault, because in the real estate business, it's very hard to scale. To put things in perspective, it took, it took uh, Marriott 125 years to open 824 buildings, and, and Adam opened 1,000 WeWorks in less than a year. So it was our fault for pushing him, but it was his fault for allowing to be pushed. So entrepreneurs are going to know where to balance aggressive private, uh, private equity or venture investors who had a lot of capital to deploy because the cost of capital was different. So growth can go you know, on both ways. And I, I do believe that great businesses grow very fast and that great entrepreneurs 
once they find their product market fit, once they find that they have a profitable business, you know, you need to push hard and grow, and you will find great venture investors or private equity investors who, once they see a great business, they will continually fund you all the way. I'm excited what you talk about growth, you know, what's going to happen later. And I think that even though AI is incredibly exciting, you know, the amount of capital that will be needed for us to reach the objectives that we've put together towards a greener world, the net zero emission by 2050, we're talking about $150 trillion, which equates to about $6 trillion a year, which is about 30 to 40 times bigger than all the tech investing that's ever been happened. And I think we're going to finally be able to find a balance to deploy a lot of capital, invest, generate money, while at the same time doing good for the environment. And this is one of those rare opportunities where there's going to be a lot of goodness, a lot of profit will be created, and we're going to do something that's going to be good for the world in the future. That's amazing. Thank you. Let's hope so. <laughs> Guys, so I'm also the president of Logistics, so I have to end on time. Uh, thank you all for coming. It was great. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Linda.